Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we are meeting on today. We also pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and all Aboriginal people participating today. Tonight's webinar will run for one hour and a half. The first section of the webinar will consist of presentations from our expert panellists and a panel discussion. For those of you who have not participated in the webinar before, you do not need to do anything during this time except sit back and enjoy the presentations. You may like to have a pen and paper ready to make some notes or jot down some questions you would like to ask later in the night. Towards the end of our session, we will have a live question and answer segment. At this time, those attending the webinar can post a question to the panel using the question and answer function in the webinar software. During the question and answer time, there will not be a presentation or audio that you hear, but you will be able to read the question and answers that are submitted and then answered by the panel members. I will spend some more time explaining the question and answer section and how to work this function later in the webinar. If you have any connection problems during the webinar, please call the numbers on your screen, quoting the meeting number provided. As I mentioned before, the webinar will be recorded and made available within the next couple of weeks on the Cancer Council website. When this is available, you will receive a link to the webinar in a follow-up email from Cancer Council. The recording will not contain a record of the questions and answers. If during the webinar or after the webinar you still feel like you have questions, please remember that you can call the Cancer Council on 13 11 20 and speak to a cancer nurse between 9am and 5pm Monday to Friday. During the webinar, some of the presentations will have links to resources or relevant websites. These links are not live in the webinar, you can't click on them directly, but they will be provided to you after the session in a follow-up email. This webinar has been created in, in acknowledgement of the range of unexpected surprises that brain cancers can present for people with cancer and their families across the tumour types and whether the tumour is benign or malignant. Cognitive changes that may be experienced vary widely from person to person and will also impact people differently, which can sometimes make talking about these issues together difficult. Topics in this webinar have been suggested by a team of brain cancer specialist nurses from the most common questions of the people they see in their practice. Tonight I'm delighted to let you know that we have a panel of expert presenters who will talk about some of the reasons for cognitive changes and some of the most frequent and challenging changes. Our first presenter this evening is Ian Gelling. Ian was diagnosed with an oligodendroglioma at the end of 2014 and underwent a combination of radiation and chemotherapy treatment earlier this year. Ian will share his experiences of cancer and the changes it has made in his life to help us put our webinar in context. Thank you for joining us tonight, Ian. Thank you for having me here. Hope, hopefully I can make it interesting. I don't want to spend too much time on the facts that I've included in the slides. They, they're hopefully self-explanatory. Uh, people can come back to me in the Q&A section to cover more if they need to. Needless to say, what I went through was very similar to what most people go through, as in it came without warning. I went, so there was a sense of shock and sadness and a sense of loss with it all. And by the end of a few months, you've had that many needles and probes, you think you've been abducted by aliens. Um, there's, I, on the slides, I've got a bit of background on myself, but needless to say, I'm just an ordinary person from an ordinary family, and it, that's who it strikes. It's not just, it doesn't discriminate. Um, I assumed I was going to have a normal life with my family and have a long future to enjoy travel and various things like that, as everyone else does, um, quickly came to the realisation that that was not going to be what my life was about for the next little while. Um, <clears throat> it came with very little warning what happened to me. Um, I did have headaches and nausea in the year leading up to it. but we attributed that to stress, which is probably fairly normal. The day I had my seizure was the scariest event of my life, and that's probably something 
that a lot of people could relate to who have had major seizures. It's, you don't know what's happening to you, your life. You don't even have time for your life to flash before your eyes. Um, you just think, I don't have, I'm having a stroke or something. Uh, and then that's it. Wake up and there's paramedics and people hanging over you. And what it, where, it depends where you fall. I, I fell onto a concrete floor, so I just had a big black eye and blood all over my face. Um, where is it? Uh, the rest the rest of the year has been a bit of a, a blur of treatment and getting used to the new me and letting go of the old me, um, which sounds easy when you say it quickly, but it's it's a very strange set of experiences. People call it a journey and get very sick of hearing it called a journey, but it, but it actually is for you and for everyone around you. Um, there's, you set little milestones, things like getting your licence back, or sorry, when you first lose your, have your seizure, you're told, one of the first things you're told is you lose your licence for six months, which sounds uh, reasonable, it, it is reasonable, but you focus on things like getting your licence back um, and learning to live without that has just been, has been such a major thing and going through the process of getting it back has been problematic as well. Um, there's, I'll, I'll just touch on that a bit. My, I think my experience with that has been a bit different to the norm. I went, you have to go through and get uh, support from optometrists and uh, oncologists and neurologists to say basically you're stable and you're, you're able to drive. Usually you go through a series of tests with occupational therapists, but for some reason I didn't. They sent me a letter. My, that, that group of people sent in their reports to Vic Rhodes, who then sent me a letter out of the blue saying I, had my, I got my licence back, which I was thrilled with. Then three weeks later I got another letter saying my licence is being suspended <laughs> for no reason. So, um, no, no, for no reason that they told me. Um, and it's so much harder giving it back the second time. Um, so as what happens now is that I have to go through the driving tests that, that everyone else had to go through, which must have been an oversight in the first place. But that's one of the many challenges and setbacks that you have to deal with along the way. Um, learning to deal, learning to, sorry, dealing with the um, the new me and the um, the post-op effect has been extremely difficult and not something you can prepare anyone for because what I've discovered is um, that each person is extremely different. What they experience, what I experience is very different because my brain is different to the person next to me and you can't, you can't anticipate what's going to happen and half the time the medical people you're dealing with are surprised by some of the symptoms as you are. So it's a bit of a journey of exploration for all of you. But uh, there's, I don't want to get too serious about it because um, one of the best coping mechanisms I've found along the way is just trying to see the funny side of things. Um, and if you look hard enough, there are a lot of funny aspects to it. Um, I guess I'm lucky in the sense that I do that. That's just naturally part of me. And my partner Jane is also the same way. So with the first the first aspect of this that got us laughing was actually when I got when I found out that I had what was wrong, what was going on, other than the fact that I'd had a um, a seizure. The way I found out what was wrong with me was an intern stuck his head through the um, the curtain when I was in emergency and said, "Oh, you're the bloke with the brain tumour." <laughs> so that was, um, you know, I think he needed to work on that. But we both it, we were both in shock, but it was quite funny looking back on it. Quite a, a odd way to find out. Um, and again, 
you can either laugh or cry at those sort of things. Um, and then one of the immediate post-op things that no one understood or only the surgeon understood was I had hiccups for four days, which sounds quite funny if you, you, know, if, if you haven't experienced it. And I kept having people tell me you know, good advice, like hold your breath. So if you've ever tried holding your breath for four days, you, yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but again, just keep. I kept looking for for things like that just to to see the funny side in it where I could, which is not easy, but it's. I think it's essential. Um, there's a whole range of issues, physical and emotional issues, that came up that I had to try and deal with, and. Um, to varying degrees, I, I did deal with them. I, um, I'll talk about the strategies of how I dealt with those in, in a sec. I want to just jump back to the, the operation for a minute, if I, if I could. Um, I, okay, I, under, I decided to have my craniotomy awake that was my choice. It was um, it was something I discussed with the surgeon and something I I understood beforehand. And I, if you if you're squeamish, it's probably not the thing to do. But it's um, it's a bizarre experience. But it's it's a really worthwhile experience, and I think minimises the damage to the surrounding brain tissue. Um, yeah, I was going to no, dog. All right. There's, as I said, there's some really odd individual things that came out of this that no one really understood, like developing a, not an allergy, but a sensitivity to perfumes. And I'd tell people, I'd have people putting a mask on me for radiation, and I'd st basically stop breathing and say, I can't, I can't breathe because of your perfume. And they'd say, but it's really expensive perfume. <laughs> and, yeah, it's just things like that. that and even swabbing the mask with alcohol, um, which no one really understood why that, that was happening. Uh, but there's, um, there's all common things like fatigue, which I think Di will talk about later. Partial tone deafness, which no one understands. I used to be able to sing. Now I'm about half a note off with my singing, which is a bit of a metaphor for my whole life nowadays. Um, and I can't... I couldn't, up until about three weeks ago, couldn't take photos because I couldn't close one eye, and it's, it, which is quite a big thing for me because I love to take photos. Um, as I said, we use both Jane and I use a lot of humour to cope with, and there are times, a lot of times, I experienced some real down times, which is n normal for this. Um, not quite, I wouldn't say depression, but feeling very sad and, and anxious because there's a, a real loss of the old you there. But my way, my most effective way of coping with that was YouTube. So I would go onto YouTube and look up things that I knew would make me laugh, things like Monty Python or Faulty Towers or whatever. And it was really effective. So I'd highly recommend that to anybody if you've got the energy to do it. Um, I would, we learnt very quickly to be very honest in speaking to each other, and this goes for my family and friends, and being very open about everything that's going on uh, to the point where I had to learn how to take constructive criticism a lot better than I used to, but it's essential to get through it because you're, you're different and you're thinking differently and acting differently. And uh, one of the things I learned at Talbot was acceptance and commitment therapy, which again is, is a form of um, therapy where you're basically just accepting what's going on and not stewing on it too much. And it's, it's brilliant. I'd recommend it to anyone. Um, what happens next to me is not something I'm worried too much about because it'll just happen. I can't control it. I just need to get on with with life as best I can and just um, 
just cope because um, I can't do anything about it and it's, it's just going to happen. Uh, there's practical issues there, but I'm not worried about those like I used to be. Uh, I just need to keep finding things to laugh at and people to enjoy laughing with. That's it. Thank you, Ian, for sharing your experience with us as our first presenter. It sounds like the last year has been a real roller coaster for you. I'm sure your story will resonate with many who are listening tonight. Our audience will be able to ask questions of you and our other presenters during our live question and answer component later in the webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second presenter, Dr. Ronnie Freilich. Dr. Freilich is a past neuro-oncology fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in New York. Since returning to Australia in 1995, he's worked as a neurologist and neuro-oncologist at Monash Medical Centre in Clayton and Cabrini Hospital in Malvern. He has a particular interest in the management of patients with primary brain tumours and the neurological complications of cancer and its treatment. Welcome, Dr. Freilich. Thank you, Kate. I'll be giving an overview of the cognitive effects of brain tumours that people may experience. Because different parts of the brain serve different functions, where the tumour is located can produce different symptoms, for example, weakness, language disturbance, visual disturbance, or cognitive impairment. If you look at various cognitive functions that may be affected, the most obvious one that people know about is memory. The memory can be both short-term and long-term memory. And a lesion within the brain that affects memory tends to affect short-term memory primarily. The cognitive function isn't just memory, there are other factors. Executive function is very important, and you can look at executive function, if you like, as being coordination of cognitive processes. Or as someone put it, it's a set of mental skills that help you get things done. So things like working memory, reasoning, multitasking, attention, abstract thinking, self-monitoring, problem solving, planning an activity and initiating that activity all falls under this uh, area of executive function and all these areas may be affected to a variable degree. Other cognitive problems are things such as visuospatial problems, not being aware of where things are around you in the uh, environment. And they can have difficulties, for example, if you're driving on the road. Language problems, which is both difficulty understanding the spoken or written word or difficulty expressing words, expressing the speech and personality change can also occur. Cognitive problems in patients with brain tumours tend to be multifactorial, which means there's often multiple causes for them, and these can include the tumour. So the tumour itself, for example, if it's in the temporal lobe, may cause language problems or memory problems. The surgery itself can cause cognitive problems. If too much brain is taken out, there can be deficits, similar as you may get weakness if too much brain is taken out. Radiotherapy can cause problems, I'll expand on that a bit later. And chemotherapy can certainly cause problems, so-called chemo brain. But there's other factors too. Seizures, can, uh, recurrent seizures can certainly lead to cognitive problems. And the medications we, treat, we use to treat the seizures, the anticonvulsants, can also cause cognitive issues. Depression will lead to problems with attention and concentration. And in fact, can worsen cognitive deficits, not by actually reducing cognition, but actually, not, actually making it appear that someone has more memory problems than, than they actually have. Dexamethasone, a steroid that is often used in patients with brain tumours, can make people hyper or manic, and they can still lead to um, personality changes. And metabolic problems such as diabetes or infection and so forth can lead to added confusion on top of someone who may have some impairment. Now, radiotherapy, these are three things that most people who've had radiotherapy to the brain experience. Fatigue is common, and that was mentioned uh, before um, by Ian, and certainly the, the degree of fatigue varies from person to person, and it can persist for a long time after the radiotherapy is given. And being fatigued can make memory loss worse. But the other thing that people who've had radiotherapy to the brain often experience is feeling the cold, and I'm yet to meet a patient who's volunteered that as a symptom, but if you ask anyone who's had radiotherapy to the brain, will almost always say that the person who's had the radiotherapy wears 10 layers of clothes and has a thermostat up to 30. Everyone else in the room is in a T-shirt and shorts. And that's probably because the radiotherapy affects the temperature regulation systems within the brain. 
So most, almost all patients who have received brain radiotherapy have some memory problems. In a small percentage of patients, as a long-term effect, years after radiotherapy is given, there can be more severe cognitive problems, things that we talked about before, and can lead to really a progressive dementia. And just to define it, dementia means a patient who has one or more cognitive deficits that is progressive and affects their ability to function. Alzheimer's disease, which everyone knows about, is one cause of dementia, but dementia really covers a broad range of, of different uh, causes. And we know that if radiotherapy is given to the whole brain, there's a higher incidence of cognitive problems. And as a general rule, with patients with primary brain tumours, the radiotherapy is given focally to as small an area of brain as possible. We know that if you give a bigger dose of radiotherapy over a shorter period of time, that's also going to cause more cognitive problems. So patients tend to get therapy over a longer period of time with a smaller dose uh, each time. And it's the long-term effects of radiotherapy, the long-term cognitive problems, that means that often with patients with lower-grade tumours, we often try to delay the effects of radiotherapy to avoid those long-term issues. In patients who've had radiotherapy, an MRI may show changes, so you may see atrophy or shrinkage of the brain or white matter ischemic changes, if you like scars around the ventricles, but the degree of change doesn't always correlate with, cl with clinical symptoms. So you see people with quite marked atrophy and not much memory loss and vice versa. Just want to touch on depression. Um, there was one study done a few years ago that said about 90% of patients with primary brain tumour reported depression at some point in their illness. And it's important to recognise depression because depression can make cognitive issues worse and there is a condition called pseudo-dementia, where people who are profoundly depressed appear to have a dementia. So if we recognise depression, talking about it, antidepressants or seeing a psychiatrist is often beneficial. Now, the issue with cognitive issues in, in, in patients with brain tumours is the same um, with all deficits, is that there's a huge spectrum of what we see. And we see patients with primary brain tumours who are working and functioning normally in the community and those who are bed-bound. And you know, it's no two people the same with this, with this tumour. And what we often see is that people have very subtle cognitive changes and often things that people you know, who don't know the person will recognise, but those close to them will recognise. And one thing that's always stuck in my mind is a comment of, of, a, of a spouse of one of my patients who said that he, he wasn't the man that, that she married. And you can have minor neurological deficits, be it cognitive, personality change, or physical that can lead to quite major lifestyle impairment and major lifestyle changes. Driving was mentioned before, but also employment issues can be a big change. And one study showed or suggested that about 60% of patients who were diagnosed with a primary brain tumour were still able to work in their previous job after diagnosis. Management, uh, very difficult area. Um, correcting the correctables. If there are uncontrolled seizures, we treat the seizures. If we think anticonvulsants are causing problems, then we change anticonvulsants. One thing we often see is patients think that they're quite fatigued due to their anticonvulsants. We change to a different drug, but that fatigue doesn't change. So we always sort of try and, and, and adjust it as, as needed. Metabolic issues are important, and clearly diabetes is not uncommon, particularly in patients in high-dose steroids, and that should be controlled. And as mentioned before, depression is a very treatable condition, and that should be controlled. An important thing from a pragmatic point of view, which I always tell patients, is to organise estate planning, that is their will, very early on after diagnosis. That's the time where they're most likely to have better cognitive function. Sometimes down the track, um, if there's a question uh, about their competence to, uh, to do a will, we'll get a neuropsychologist to assess their competence. And the issue is that wills, unfortunately, can be challenged. And over the years, I have had situations where relatives have come and challenged a will. And more recently, we've had letters from the probate office who processed a will, seen that the will was done within a short time from the time of death, and have questioned whether the patient was competent to do the will. So it's important to get those sort of affairs in, in order. And what's important with management is I think it's really understanding what the problems are. I mean, there's a lot of changes happen, and if a patient, and particularly the carers, understand what the changes are, what the deficits are, what it all means, it actually helps to sort of cope with it and understand it. And sometimes we refer patients for neuropsychology testing. So a neuropsychologist is a psychologist trained in cognitive function. They'll do a three or four hour battery of tests 
will help define exactly what those cognitive deficits are. We'll sometimes say, hey, there's a large degree of depression, we can treat that. But having that sort of um, ability to, to outline those deficits is, I think, a value for, for patients and carers. And the neuropsychologist can give advice on how to cope with those deficits. So just to summarise, cognitive deficits are very common in patients with brain tumours, but there's a huge variability in the severity and what the deficits are. And as I said, it's often easier for carers and patients to cope if they have a better understanding of what the issues are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freilich, for giving us that overview of some of the cognitive changes that are, can occur in brain cancers. I'm sure our audience will have many questions for you in the question and answer section at the end of this webinar. We will now take a closer look at two common areas of cognitive change that present challenges for people with benign or malignant tumours and their families. Catherine McKinley is a speech pathologist who has worked with adults in the area of neurological rehabilitation for more than 15 years. She has a special interest in working with people with communication difficulties following a diagnosis of stroke or brain tumour, including in the area of supporting and training families and carers to communicate with people experiencing a brain tumour or stroke. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Kate. People can experience a range of communication problems following the diagnosis of a brain tumour, as well as communication problems associated with the treatment of a brain tumour. This is dependent on the location and size of the tumour and whether it is affecting the language parts of the brain, the thinking parts of the brain or the motor parts of the brain. Given the wide range of communication difficulties people may experience, this evening I'll talk through some of the more common types of communication difficulties and provide you with some ideas and strategies to help support someone with a communication difficulty. Communicating is complex and we often take communication for granted until something goes wrong. When we are having a conversation with someone, there is a lot going on. To participate in a conversation, we need to be able to understand what the other person is saying, work out what it is that we want to say, choose the right words, put the right words in the right order in a sentence, and then say it. And we also need to concentrate on what the other person is saying, remember what we have said and what others have said, take turns in the conversation and keep it balanced and pick up on social cues too, so keeping an eye on whether someone is interested in what we're saying, looking at their body language. So there is a lot that we do. Another important thing to understand about communication is that it is a creative act. We do make it up as we go along. We start with having something that we want to communicate and then we draw on the best resources we have available to us to do this. These resources include our own language and cognitive abilities. And we also draw on resources available to us in that situation, including our environment and the people we are communicating with. Now that we know that communicating is complex and creative, we can begin to understand that it can very easily go wrong. I'm sure we've all experienced an occasion where what we say might be misunderstood or we might misinterpret someone else and communication breaks down. However, communication disabilities occur when a person has a loss or reduction in a function that impacts on their ability to communicate. So this might be due to changes in hearing, changes in thinking or cognition, such as difficulty with attention or memory or planning, Changes in language, so understanding what you've heard or read, as well as problems with writing and talking. And then problems with speech, so this might be being able to say the speech sounds, changes in voice or changes in intonation. Some common communication difficulties that people with brain tumours report and experience are word finding difficulties, so not being able to think of the word that you, that you want to say talking too much in a conversation, having difficulty staying on topic, not being able to express an idea clearly, so using lots of words to say something or using non-specific words, not being able to start a conversation or keep it going, having difficulty understanding what's being said or read, and communication breakdowns. 
where the message might not be clear. And some people may not be aware or have any insight into these changes. So it may be family and friends that are, that are aware of these cha communication changes. When communication breaks down, this presents a challenge for the person with brain cancer and their conversation partner. Communication is really important. It's how we tell people what we need and want, so our basic needs and wants, and it's also how we develop and maintain relationships with people that play such an important role in our day-to-day -day lives. So what can we do to help? There are many strategies that can help both the person with the brain tumour and their carers, friends and family. Here are some strategies that help both. So being patient, keeping calm, trying to relax. Communication is harder when we're more stressed and anxious. Reducing distractions in your environment, so turning the TV or the radio off. Using strategies to help. These might be specific ones from a speech pathologist or ones that you've worked out that work for both for you both. You might work out that it helps to have more important conversations in the morning versus the afternoon when you're less, when you're less tired in the morning. Writing things down to help understanding or to help recall a conversation. And checking in with each other. Are we on the same page? Is this helping? Is this working? Or is this not helping or working? Word finding difficulties are common, and here is an example of some strategies that can help when someone is having difficulty finding a word. Um, often people don't like uh, others jumping in and saying the word for them, so you know, they can often use some cues to, to help. You know, what, what does it look like, or who does it remind me of, or when would you use it, or where would you find it? Um, these strategies can often help that person um, come up with the word themselves. And if not, we might still be able to understand what it is they're trying to think of or say. In these next couple of slides, I'm going to go through some strategies to support communication, particularly aimed at the communication partner. So our attitude to conversation is important. How we say something is just as important as what's being said. Using an adult tone of voice, so speaking normally, speaking at a normal rate, normal loudness, not talking slowly and loudly like people are deaf. Being sensitive to your partner. So watch your partner, understand that this that communication might be hard for them and show this by being patient and encouraging them to communicate. Openly acknowledging frustration. I can see that this is hard for you or I can see that you're frustrated. Being patient, again, I've put that in there, waiting some time before jumping in, you know, waiting for an answer, and being encouraging of attempts at communication and conversation. Being open to using resources to support communication. These might be strategies, gesture, technology, photos, to help support a conversation and help um, increase success when communicating and providing opportunities and support to ask questions. So encourage a conversation that is two-way, asking open-ended questions, allowing space to ask questions, and having a conversation around something, uh, around um, a topic of interest. Now, the next thing we can do as communication partners is to think about the following areas. Can the person understand what I'm saying? Am I speaking clearly? Am I speaking at a level? they can understand, or do I need to modify the language I'm using? Can the person ask or answer questions? What can I do to help that? Would it help to write down questions or ask what questions might you have for me? And then have I understood what the person has said? Are we all on the same page or has there been a breakdown in communication? At the end of a conversation or along the way, it's important to check. Did I get you? Have I understood you correctly? Um, sometimes we let things slide, um, but if it's important, then you know we should go back and, and check in that we're on the same page. Okay. Communication partner training is, avail is available to support and help partners, families, friends, carers to learn ways that they can support someone with a communication difficulty or disability. 
from the very mild subtle changes to communication to the more significant changes. The aim of communication partner training is to provide education and support and to develop strategies to support conversations and interactions. And if you'd like some support and education, then speak to a speech pathologist. You know, that's what we're here for. There are some online resources and training available and there is a link here to a training resource that has been developed for people with brain tumors, oh, um, with brain injury. Parts of this training would be relevant for people with a brain tumor who have more thinking or cognitive type difficulties that are impacting on communication and conversation. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you for those insights and those practical strategies. I'm sure our audience will have many questions when we come to our question and answer segment. Now, last but definitely not least, uh, I'd like to welcome our final presenter this evening. Diane Legg is a senior occupational therapist with over 25 years experience in adult neurology, mental health and brain cancer care. For the past six years, Diane has worked as the Brain Tumor Support Coordinator at the Olivia Newton-John Cancer and Wellness Centre for the Austin Health Organisation in Heidelberg, Victoria. Thank you for joining us this evening, Di. Thanks, Kate. Uh, as an occupational therapist, I'm really aware that a, a brain tumor can really impact on getting on with your day-to-day -day activities. And so in this section, I really want to talk about some of the most common challenges that people face and some ways to renegotiate your environment and um, perhaps change the way sometimes you do things. I often talk to patients about taming the energy vampires because I think sometimes fatigue can really drain absolutely everything out of you. So this type of fatigue or tiredness that I'm talking about is not the sort that you can easily bounce back from, maybe like you did before your diagnosis. It can be more than just chemo fog or chemo brain, as it's often called. It can perhaps be long standing and, and difficult to recover from. So it's not like you can just have a good sleep or a couple of early nights and just get over it. So, fatigue or tiredness um, would have to be one of the most common problems talked about by patients. And it's really well documented in the, in the literature um, as, as one of the biggest challenges for people with brain tumours. And as Ronnie and Catherine and Ian talked about, it can really affect many areas of your life. How you function, how you relate to people, how you participate in activities, and um, maybe you don't necessarily get weary and fall asleep on the couch, but you might get really annoyed or quite scratchy with people, or maybe forgetful or can't pay attention to something, or you may be at a greater risk of perhaps having a seizure. And because of this, it can be pretty difficult to figure out what to do. So part of the fatigue story is about simple mechanics of the situation. The brain's, of course, in a confined space in the skull, so any pressure builder may affect the circuitry within the brain. The impact of the position and size of the tumour itself can have an impact, or the effect of medication and treatment such as radiotherapy and any swelling that, uh, as a result of the radiotherapy, can really create a barrier to any efficient information processing. So, why do you get tired? Fatigue may be one of the factors, um, could be as a result of any one of the factors listed here that could impact on fatigue. So, as I said before, it could be the position and size of the tumour and any possible treatment side effects. It might be slowed down thinking or um, processes that reduce your capacity sort of to multitask. And adding the diagnosis of a brain tumour into the mix of a busy life, like family and commitments and other medical issues, might impact on your tiredness or fatigue. The big one is something like sensory overload. Being in environments where there's competition for your attention. A good example, and one I was actually in recently, was the Apple store in Doncaster. It was such a busy environment, it was just exhausting being in there for 10 minutes, so I can't even imagine what it would be like if you were impacted by that sort of sensory overload. Obviously, being worried or stressed can also make us feel exhausted and tired, and that can really affect our sleep and rest abilities. And as Roddy mentioned, feeling sad or depressed can also make you feel fatigued. It can mean that you don't look after yourself, you don't eat properly, perhaps you don't exercise, you don't sleep. So what's important and what's not? 
I recognise that there's so many things about having a brain gym that you cannot control. So I want to focus on the things that you and your family are able to do to get through fatigue. This is really about creating some good habits for future challenges. And the reality is that fatigue may not go away completely. So it's more about putting up, uh, putting some things in place that can help you cope in the long term. I think the key, to, the key to managing fatigue is really planning and trying to manage those things that you can control. Using self-management principles such as some goal setting, tackling activities at a realistic pace, putting your energy into things that are of greatest value to you can all help with that. And as Catherine talked about, letting those around you know how the fatigue affects you is also really important. And always the best way to do this is when you can talk quite openly. And hopefully some family members and carers are on board this evening that, listen, that are listening to this. The last comment really is important to remember it's no time for superheroes. That I think that it's important to be realistic about what you're trying to achieve and um, to, to pace things so you can um, be successful in what you're trying to do. Okay, some practical tips. The next three slides are focusing on some strategies and practical tips. I think the first thing is really to um, try to look after yourself. So eating well, drinking good amounts of water, keeping hydrated. And I know this seems a bit counterintuitive, but doing a bit of exercise, so even just some walking or some stretching or getting up and about a little bit really helps um, manage, um, gives you a better level of energy, it helps manage fatigue. Work out for you what activities give you a bit of a boost, okay? Um, and work out perhaps what saps your energy, but really keep some activities that give you a bit of a boost. That'll help you rotate your activities a little bit. So it might be that you need to do some, you know, some domestic chores. It might be that you need to do a little bit of exercise. It might be that you need to look after yourself or you have to do something that's a bit more thinking orientated. Another thing I think Catherine mentioned this is getting to know your high energy and low energy time. So it might be that you're better off doing some things that you have to really concentrate on in the morning because you're feeling a bit more sprightly and then you need to do some quieter, um, more relaxed activities in the afternoon. Spending your energy quite wisely on the activities of greatest value is also important. In terms of sensory overload, this is pretty common sense but I think sometimes uh, uh, common sense is not very common. I think trying to create a quiet space in your life and just to be able to power down regularly. Identify what are the things that sort of really um, trigger your um, feeling overwhelmed and overloaded. And um, perhaps accept your choices on activities. If you really wanted to go to the football grand final, but you need to sort of accept that for the next few days you're going to be pretty tired. And maybe that's a choice that you're willing to make and that's fine. It's just about recognising that. I always tell people they need to adopt a champion, someone who can perhaps notice that they're getting a little bit overwhelmed or exhausted before they do. And uh, I think avoiding the energy vampires, as I call them, so that's the TV or having the iPad on while the radio's on, you're trying to have a conversation. Perhaps busy shopping centres like Chasden at Christmas or Apple stores or things like that can really suck the energy out of you. So it means that you just need to be aware of that and maybe try and power down or have a rest during that time. Some practical tips about cognitive slowdown is really just trying to identify your strengths and Ronnie talked about um, maybe having some testing, identify what were you were good at beforehand, maybe there are things that might help you now. Getting some help to develop some strategies, so that might be through some rehab with an OT or a psychologist or a speech therapist. Identifying, as I said, your best time of your day, getting yourself a bit moving a bit and minimising those multitasking demands. And as I mentioned before, rotating things a little bit. One of my last slides is really um, being aware to um, try and deal with some of those emotional challenges. Stress and worry really can't be ignored and it's important to access some support. So whether it's through um, a helpline of some sort, phoning a friend, a health professional, um, really acknowledging some of those challenges that you face and trying to get a bit active because that really can really help some of those emotional challenges. So what's meaningful to you? What's important? I think it's important to play to your strengths 
and really um, find some time to recharge. Thanks. Thank you, Diane, for taking us through some of the issues and strategies for managing these aspects of living with a brain tumour. At this time, um, we'll be joined uh, by all of our panellists for a short question and answer session. Questions in this section have been taken from the most common questions our audience members asked when they registered to take part in the event. Uh, we do have um, three or four quite meaty questions, so we'll hope to get to as many of them as we can. And of course, we have our question and answer section following, uh, which we can return to these questions if that's of interest to our participants. Several uh, participants um, asked about brain elasticity and brain training or retraining. Um, I was wondering, uh, first off, the, the rank, Dr. Freilich, if you'd like to give us a, a brief insight into this topic. Thanks, uh, Kate. Well, interesting topic, and I suppose quite complex. There are several parts to this. Um, part of brain that has been damaged may have some form of recovery, and I suppose one example is that after surgery, people sometimes have a worse deficit because of pushing and pulling a bit of swelling in that area. And as that swelling diminishes, then that part of the brain will, will recover. Brain plasticity really means that other parts of the brain can sort of help take over. And it's a bit more complex in, in patients with, with brain tumours. In patients, for example, with a, a stroke or a head injury, the deficit happens and it stays and doesn't change. But in brain tumours, things can progress over time, be it the tumour progressing or the effects of radiotherapy. So sort of actual brain training, getting the other parts of the brain to sort of uh, take over is, is a bit limited. But what's important is to keep both mind and, and body active. We know that as someone who regularly engages their, their brain in things, you know, we always say do crossword puzzles. If you don't like doing crossword puzzles, no point doing it, but at least having conversations with people, if you can read, talking, discuss newspapers, those sort of things help anyone with any memory problems really across the board. And really keeping your body active, if you can walk, do a bit of exercise, it has been shown to help cognitive function as well. There are sort of various uh, uh, um, things you can do, and of course making the most of, of the positives, you know, things you can do, you know, as, as Diane mentioned before, I think focusing on those is always important, and sort of reinforcing those issues do, does help. Thank you so much, Dr. Freilich. Diane, I'm wondering if this is something you've explored with your patients. Uh, certainly something that comes up in our support group um, occasionally and um, I certainly, um, I guess, talk to patients about what they can do to really help themselves improve. And I, I suppose the things that I really talk about are, um, again, what I mentioned before, is really playing to your strengths, uh, trying to work out what is, um, is comfortable and, and, and easy for you to do and what are the things that you need more support with. So sometimes you can work that out as in a discussion with um, people that you're involved with, as family or friends, but sometimes it might help to have a neuropsychology assessment just to really work out what your strengths are, and so you can play to that. Um, as I mentioned, and also Ronnie just then, I think staying a bit active um, really helps you um, helps manage your fatigue, and also, you know, there has been some research showing that can kind of help you keep you a bit mentally fit, so I think being a bit active and um, and keeping your brain a little, a little bit active. But again, sort of balancing that to make sure you power down and have some time where you're looking after yourself. So I think that's important. Thank you. Our uh, next question is one that I think all our presenters can talk to. Um, but I'd like to ask uh, Diane and Catherine uh, for their top suggestion from the work that they do, and then ask Ian to sum up what's helped or not helped him. Um, so the question is, what are the best strategies for me to support my loved one without taking away their sense of independence? Uh, Diane, would you like to start? Sure. I, I think um, it's really about working out what's important. And I think that is often a little bit different for everybody, but I think making sure that those communication lines are open and I think in some ways for families and carers it's about sort of picking your battles a little bit and working out what's going to be the thing that's most important. I think sometimes the patients and families that I work with, safety can be a little bit of an issue. So some of those things might be a bit non-negotiable and health professionals can always help with that talk. But I, I think it's really about working out what's important and a little bit of um, managed risk I think is really important to do. And people can often feel like they lose a lot 
in, with the, um, having a brain tumour diagnosis mm -hmm. and um, being able to regain some independence is very important. So mm -hmm. it's a balance. Thanks, Diane. Catherine? Uh, I would agree with uh, what Diane has said. I think finding out what's important um, to the person with brain cancer is um, uh, is a great strategy, and under, you know, having having some, having a good understanding of you know what challenges they might be experiencing, what's important to them, um, and working out what's working and what doesn't work. Um, and you know, and what can I do to help? Um, you know, it is it is always a negotiation, and you know, I think you know, being really open about that and and having those discussions. I mean, sometimes you you might be able to do that on one to one, or sometimes you might need someone else um, there to help facilitate that discussion. Um, but I think it, it really is important to keep keep the um, lines of communication open. Thank you, Catherine and Ian. Uh, I'd, yeah, I'd, no, I'd agree with all of that. Uh, I think one thing you said before, Di, about speaking to the person like they're an adult in an adult voice, I think is one of the most important things. Um, remember you're dealing with a person who's irrational, often irrational, uh, except for me, um, <laughs> and they're living in a world of frustration and you've got to have some empathy there when, when you're approaching the conversation. But things that have worked for, for me or for us is going to appointments and support groups together so you, each person has the, the same information and the same understanding of what's going on. It's sort of like having a new baby. <coughs> so you're approaching it as parents of this new baby, not a very cute baby, but um, you, you, it's all new and you're learning it together so you're sort of sharing the experience. and. Uh, a lot of open and honest conversations about what's changed and I think you have to expect a little conflict and a few bumps along the way too. That's really Thank you Anne. Um, a number of people registering asked about personality change uh, from an awareness of having altered filters in choosing what to say to changes that really flummox the whole family. Um, so I was wondering Dr. Farlett would you have anything that you'd like to talk to here? Yeah, look, again, a, a very good question, a very difficult area. I, I think primarily it's actually recognising that there has been a change and recognising that the person who's known for possibly many years is a slightly different person to who they were before and things they say and do don't necessarily reflect what they were doing before, but that's the, 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 the new reality, if you like. It can be very frustrating for partners and carers and kids and everyone. And you see, as a, as a general neurologist, I see patients with cognitive deficits from all types, um, older people with Alzheimer's disease, for example, and you see family members trying to argue with them, don't you remember this, why don't you do this, and all that does is frustrate the person, the, the family, the carers, the friends, and the patient themselves. So it's really recognising that change and accepting it and working around it. Um, there are some areas where sometimes if a person becomes agitated, that can sometimes happen, then sometimes medication can be used, and again, sometimes seeing a psychiatrist or psychologist or neuropsychologist can help delineate actually care for those issues. But it is, as I said, a, a very big area and, and something that, as mentioned before, even can be very subtle changes which those people around around the person notice. Thank you very much. And Diane? Um, I, I think I often talk to a lot of families about this kind of challenge and I think um, sometimes it's about understanding why uh, what are sort of the triggers for the individual person and it could be a busy environment is the trigger and they get a bit overloaded. So working out what is the thing that actually um, means that there's a change. Um, and I think being able to plan that through and sort of agree on a bit of a strategy is important. Um, in the slides before I mentioned adopting a champion, I think this is really good. I work with a doctor who often says you need someone to be your frontal lobe, um, which really just means that they need someone to say, oh, look, love, I think well, maybe you're a little bit tired or maybe it's time for us to go now or, or just to sort of help um, monitor that stuff a little bit. And I think being able to do that in an environment where it's not too stressful, so don't sort of, um, you know, deal with that sort of in a public environment, be able to sit down quietly later on and talk to a bit of a plan is good. Um, 
But I think ensuring that someone's not too tired or trying to work out what their triggers are is important. Thank you. And Catherine? Um, you know, it's, it's, these changes in personality, um, you know, can be really difficult to manage, um, especially when, you know, we're trying to preserve a relationship and the relationship is really important. So, um, you know, so I, I would suggest, you know, going cautiously and, um, you know, when you're having those conversations, remembering that you know, you're still talking to an adult, you're still talking to someone who you care very, you know, deeply for and, and if there are some subtle changes, um, you know, working out a way to talk about those changes, they mightn't have any awareness into that person with brain cancer, might not be aware of those changes. Um, so it might be, you know, it might be about bringing it into someone's awareness so they can make some changes and you know, have a better understanding of, or that, you know, this, you know, this is how I'm different. Um, so, I mean, you know, I've talked um, earlier about open communication. It is a good opportunity um, to have a chat around, you know, what, what's okay and, and what's not okay, you know, what's, you know what, what helps and what doesn't help. And I think, you know, that's beneficial for both the person with the brain tumour as well as the carer, you know, can work out what it is that, you know, you're happy to go forward with. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, many people registering for tonight's webinar indicated interest in finding out about clinical trials and other research projects. Um, however, for reasons of time, we could only really scratch the surface in the, the very barest way of this question. So I will encourage um, all of our participants to um, come and ask uh, the question in our live question and answer section, which will be starting very soon. And of course, um, we encourage all participants to call our cancer nurses on 13 11 20 um, and find out more, more about initiatives such as the Clinical Trials Locator app. I'm just going to come now to each of our, um, our speakers to wrap up our panel discussion and just ask each of our panellists for a key message uh, for people experiencing or supporting someone going through cognitive changes relating to brain cancer. Uh, I might start with Ian, what's a, a key thought for you? A uh, key thought, I'd like to um, jump onto Di's idea of a champion and I think that's one of the if not the most important part of getting through it is having someone that you can absolutely trust to be honest with you and to be assertive with your family and your friends when they need to be to preserve your the calmness of your environment. Thank you, Ian. And Catherine? Uh, a key message for me is remembering how you say something is just as important as what you're saying. So. Um, as you're as you're going along, talking to each other, remembering that you you know you're adults and um, that you can still have great conversations and just you know thinking you know it's important about how we communicate, not only what's said. Thank you, and Dr. Bradley. Yeah, just to reiterate what we said before, that cognitive deficits are very common in patients with brain tumours. It's often multifactorial in origin but there's a huge variability in what the actual deficits are and the severity of those deficits. And it's often easier for carers and patients to cope with the deficits and help manage the situation if they understand the nature of the actual problem. Thank you. And Diane? I think the, the key message for me is that um, these challenges aren't just happening to one person, they're happening to you know the partnership or the family or um, not just the um, one person, so it's really important to work together and come up with a strategy. And it'll be a, you know, it'll depend on the family and, and, the, and the couple. But depending, um, agreeing on a strategy, I suppose it's going to work for everybody. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their knowledge and for providing us with some excellent advice and practical strategies there. Our panelists will be available until 8:30 tonight to answer your questions. Uh, so at this time, we're going to transition from the webinar presentation to the question and answer session. Uh, some of you may choose at this time to end your participation in the webinar, and we just thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, for all Victorians affected by cancer, the best way to get reliable information and connect with relevant support services is to call Cancer Council 13 11 20. Calls are answered by cancer nurses with experiences in major cancer types. The line is open um, from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. If anyone calls after hours, the nurses will get back to them as soon as possible the next business day and aim to answer emails within 48 hours. 
Nurses do not provide individual medical advice, however, only general information um, and all calls and emails are confidential.